Welcome to the second episode of our series of three critical conversations about the future of the Commonwealth. I'm your host, Victoria Rubedewi. Now, for those of you joining us for the first time, this series has been inspired by the 10-year anniversary of the report of the Commonwealth Eminent Persons Group, or EPG, on the future of the Commonwealth. Well, that report was a landmark, and its goal was to, quote, shape a truly contemporary organization meeting the aspirations and expectations of the citizens of the Commonwealth. Well, it's been 10 years since that report, and we've convened this series of critical conversations to look back at the performance of the Commonwealth in light of the report's recommendations and to examine the Commonwealth from where we are today and to look to the future with all its hopes, its possibilities, and of course, its challenges. second conversation will road test the Commonwealth by interrogating the role it could and should play in the big issues that really matter to its people, with a particular focus on the pandemic response and climate change. Is there a lack of solidarity in the Commonwealth's response to the most pressing challenges of the day? Or are our expectations just unrealistic? Well, what do the experiences of COVID-19 and COP26 tell us about the Commonwealth system and where we need to focus our efforts to reform and reimagine? Our first critical conversation in this series brought together two of the members of the Eminent Persons Group, Justice Michael Kirby from Australia and Samuel Kavuma from Uganda, with leaders and activists from Africa and the Caribbean. They talked about what it means to be a citizen of the Commonwealth. We did not shy away from asking the hard questions about the difficulties and the contradictions that have been part of the Commonwealth story. For this discussion, we have brought together prominent individuals from across the Commonwealth with a fantastic range of views and experience. Let's meet our panel. Well, Sir Ronald Sanders was a member of the Eminent Persons Group and one of the authors of the report on the future of the Commonwealth. He is currently the ambassador of Antigua and Barbuda to the United States. Welcome. Sir Sanders. William Shoki is a talented political journalist from South Africa, and he is the staff writer for Africa is a Country, which publishes opinion, analysis, and new writing on and from Africa. And last but not least, we have Alicia Wallace from the Bahamas, who's a women's rights activist, a public educator, movement builder, and writer. Welcome all. I also had the privilege of speaking earlier to Sir Peter Gluckman from New Zealand. He's the president of the International Science Council and chair of the International Network of Government Science Advisors. We'll be sharing an excerpt of our conversation a bit later on. Um, Sir Ronald, if I will uh, start with you. I, I want to kind of begin and get your reflections on a particular sentence from the Eminent Persons Report, uh, which read, on issues such as development, trade and investment, climate change and global pandemics, the Commonwealth is in danger of becoming immaterial as beleaguered nations look elsewhere for the help they need. You know, what are your thoughts on, on this warning 10 years down the track, almost a self-fulfilling prophecy, if you will. My thoughts are that exactly what was said has come to pass. The Commonwealth is totally relevant to those matters. 
because it has not taken any initiatives on them. The Commonwealth Immigrant Persons Group Report, which was, you will remember, called A Commonwealth of the People, Time for Urgent Reform, did not urgently reform at all. And if one were to look at the recommendations that uh, were made, they are significant in terms of what the Commonwealth has not done, uh, as distinct from what it could have done. So today we are in the midst of a COVID-19 pandemic and there was no Commonwealth response. Uh, in fact, if anything, the Commonwealth was singularly uh, significant by the fact that it did have no response. Uh, with regard to COP26 uh, and indeed all of the COPs that have gone before, we've heard a lot of mouthings, um, but really no joint coordinated activity from the Commonwealth. And if you look at where Commonwealth countries are in relation to COP26 now, uh, as happening in Glasgow, you'll find them all over the place. Uh, there is no coordinated approach. There's been no attempt to make a coordinated approach. There's been a nationalistic approach, both to the problem of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, in which countries have adopted nationalistic positions rather than trying to coordinate the kind of international response that is the only effective response to COVID-19. And we're seeing exactly the same thing in relation uh, to, uh, to COP26. That is why, for instance, my own country, Antigua and Barbuda, and another small island from uh, the Pacific, Tuvalu, decided that enough was enough at COP26. We've had enough promises about loss and damage uh, that has been done to our countries over the years, amounting to billions of dollars, uh, with no compensation whatsoever. So we have launched a commission uh, on international law, which is now backed by a, a group of very significant international lawyers. And we are going to litigate this matter by, first of all, seeking a, a legal opinion from the United Nations uh, 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 from the United Nations Commission on the Law of the Sea on whether we can actually be successful if we take forward that, uh, that argument. But we are pretty assured uh, that we will be able to get a, a legal opinion that suggests that even in the law of tort, if you damage and you continuously damage, then at some point you have to pay. So in your view, the Commonwealth's rating in terms of multilateralism uh, was quite dismal, especially when you talk about the pandemic and its response. You described it as uncoordinated and nationalistic in its approach. But before we get into the substance of this second conversation, let's hear some of my discussion that I had earlier with Sir Peter Gluckman on this. Sir Peter, thank you so much for sparing time to speak with me today. You know, the pandemic has brought the issue of multilateralism to the fore and looking at the Commonwealth and the role it can and really should be playing in similar crises. Can you explain why multilateralism and multilateral institutions are so important and, and what their limitations are? One of the things that COVID has brought to the fore is a focus on the state of multilateralism. I think there's no doubt that if we look at the science community, we saw brilliant multilateral, informal and formal relationships around the world, which moved our understanding of the virus and then the development of the vaccine so rapidly. Without multilateral cooperation between scientists, we would be in a much worse state than we are now. On the other hand, if we are frank about the multilateral institutions, they failed us. Uh, it's clear that the early stages of the pandemic were, uh, were managed badly uh, because of the weak state of, of following international health regulations and at the WHO. It's disappointing how slow the UN system as a whole outside the WHO was to respond to the pandemic. And I think that when you look at the uh, multilateral response eventually, which came with COVAX and so forth, it remains poor and the inequities of health outcomes and the inequities of uh, vaccine distribution remain very obvious. And I think we need to really reflect on this. At one level, the scientists were very able to cooperate 
They wanted to cooperate. They used informal mechanisms to cooperate. The formal process was still dominated by nationalism and national self-interest over global, uh, a global a recognition that it needed a global solution. Yeah, that's interesting. So how would you grade the Commonwealth's response to the pandemic? And what does that tell us about the Commonwealth as a multilateral body? Well, as a global institution, it wasn't really very visible at all. On the other hand, within the Commonwealth family of countries, there were lots of relationships that actually reflected that history, those that, that heritage. So, for example, how Australia and New Zealand worked to assist some of the Pacific Island state members of the Commonwealth was a good example of the relationship that the Commonwealth could be, if it worked at scale, that it could have been. But in fact, in all the work that we've done on looking how countries took advice and took input, the Commonwealth never really it really stood out. And I think it's a reflection of what the Commonwealth should be and could be. All said and done, it's about a quarter of the global states, from the largest state in the world, India, to probably the smallest state in the world, one of the small Pacific Island states. It has, as you said, largely a common heritage and an awful lot of connectivity between individual within the Commonwealth. It might have been a lot easier if the Commonwealth was an effective body in pushing the multilateral system more formally and to take global action, because it should be a lot easier for the nations of the Commonwealth, if they took an active role together, to form a caucus which could have been more effective globally. And equally, I think given the commonalities within the Commonwealth, some of the systems of on the technical side, could have been, if the Commonwealth had technical support systems, it could have assisted many of these countries more sophisticated and more effectively. So I think the Commonwealth missed an opportunity. And if you go back to the the, the distinguished group report of 10 years ago, uh, you would see the opportunity was identified there, particularly in health, particularly in science, where the Commonwealth could be a, a, a significant entity. And so I think the Commonwealth needs to think, is it just going to remain a nice thing for people, for leaders of states to get together? Or could it be a force for real good in demonstrating that multilateralism can exist in a world where, unfortunately, as a whole, because of a change in superpower relationships, uh, the multilateral system is weak and nationalism has become so much stronger? I think the Commonwealth could, if it took the effort, be a catalyst for a, cha a, for a revision of what multilateralism is, both in the policy and in the technical sense. But I don't, and the eminent persons group a decade ago really said that in their report. But I think the opportunity has not been picked up. Well, not a favorable assessment, but taking into account what you know about the Commonwealth from the EPG report and the pandemic response and really everything in between, what could be done to reinvigorate the Commonwealth so it can be a more influential player in the face of global crises? The lessons that we should come from looking at how the Commonwealth was absent or largely absent in the in the pandemic should be reflected upon. Because I think if you look ahead, the Commonwealth countries face major challenges from climate change, both directly but indirectly and its impact on many of the countries in terms of social cohesion, in terms of, of water, food, energy security, and so forth. And while the issues are global and include all 200 states of the world, the Commonwealth is a very representative subset uh, from the largest to the smallest countries, from the rich, some very rich countries to very, very poor countries. From, and I think that if the Commonwealth thought about whether it just wants to remain a, if you like, a, a historical legacy 
or whether it wants to reinvigorate a focus on thinking about new forms of governance, of thinking of ways of engaging citizens better, of improving social cohesion, on giving emphasis to things like human rights around which the, and the rule of law, which the Commonwealth previously used to strengthen on one hand, and then thought, where are the technical things that could be supported, given that you have some, some of the best scientists in the world, some of the best experts in the world in the countries of the Commonwealth, both from the traditional global north countries in the Commonwealth, but also in many of the emergent states of the Commonwealth. We should be bringing that talent together to the issues where, because we speak with a relatively in general, with a commonality of institutions around science, around governance, around legislation and so forth. We could do so much more if we worked together. We could demonstrate that that multilateralism in the technical sense, which I think is the basis of getting good multilateralism at the political sense, uh, could be done. And I think if we could get a Commonwealth Science Network, a Commonwealth... uh, into a real form, for example, it could have, it could be very useful. I think that particularly we have states and a large number of states in the Commonwealth who will always be limited just by the reality of their geography and their population size. We need to think of ways of how we take moral responsibility for imparting and making them abil- have abilities to be part of the world as true partners and their talents, which are really there often, the entrepreneurial and the innovative talents to make these small countries work. How do we do that? How do we help them thrive in a a situation where they're going to face greater challenges than any other countries on the planet with climate change and so forth? Now, I'm not being an idealist. I think that we've seen in the past history that clusters of countries can come together to tackle problems. I think the Commonwealth leaders have to decide whether this is an institution of the past or an institution of the future. If it's an institution of the future, then it needs to think about how countries, all the countries of the Commonwealth, are going to respond to the technological developments, the digital age, how it can be used to help them, and equally how we work constructively both within the Commonwealth and beyond to deal with the existential threats of climate change, uh, 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 threats to social cohesion and so forth. I regard the Commonwealth's traditional and historical focus on human rights as a very important legacy because I think with all the challenges ahead, of climate change, of climate refugees, of various insecurities which will emerge, as we've seen already in the pandemic, social cohesion is the other big existential risk. Loss of social cohesion is a huge issue globally. And I think that historical legacy of human rights and focusing on the development of democracy, of proper institutions, uh, 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 is part of the response and preparing for climate change and what's to it. And the Commonwealth is probably, in theory, better placed than any other multilateral organisation to think about those issues and even though, and, and hopefully get spillover to the rest of the world. Now, that may be sounding idealistic, but I think a real serious think about what the Commonwealth could be is needed. And it either needs to say... It is something like a museum piece. We look at with fondness and respect. We say there is a set of reasons that need to be developed and built, not just around uh, policymakers, leaders of states getting together, but actually saying how does the changing state of talent within the Commonwealth be used to better the life of all the citizens in the Commonwealth. So, Glockman, thank you so much for your time. Fantastic insights that will certainly have the panellists thinking a lot more critically 
uh, when it comes to the Commonwealth's response to crises in general. Thank you once again. Well, speaking now with our panel, you know, what are your immediate thoughts on Sir Peter's comments? Alicia, let me come to you. What kind of report card would you give the Commonwealth in relation to its response to the pandemic? In terms of a report card, I would have to give the Commonwealth marks for attendance by being affected by the pandemic, perhaps for class participation, talking a little bit in segments as a part of the conversation, but in terms of actually completing and turning in the assignment, I don't know. I don't know. It's definitely not going to be any much, anything more than a C. And what we really needed from the Commonwealth was to actually bring states and institutions and people together to talk about the challenges that we were facing. Because a lot of what we're dealing with right now was predictable. I know that it's predictable because I was a part of a group, the Feminist Alliance for Rights, that put together policy guidelines for governments as they started to implement legislation to sort of control the spread of COVID-19. Thinking about the impact that such legislation would have, such as the increase in domestic violence that has happened, that has been predicted by women's rights groups, by feminist groups, it's quite obvious. So there's no reason that the Commonwealth could not have tapped into the expertise, the knowledge, the scientific information that is held by various bodies and various people that make up the Commonwealth. I think one of the biggest failures at this point is not using the resources that have been available to us and bringing people together for peer learning, for collaboration, and for thinking about how we can come up with our own shared position on some of these issues and figuring out who has what, what can we bring to the table, who should be involved, who is often forgotten, who are the people that are excluded, who are the people who are most likely to be left behind by some of the policies and legislation that are put in place. How can we center those people? What are your needs? What have been your experiences? What are your fears? What do you think is going to happen if X, Y, Z? Bringing them together to talk about that and to build solutions that don't just include them, but center them. William, uh, you heard Alicia give Commonwealth uh, a C in terms of its response. Um, you know, what should it then do? in terms of improving its performance and, and you know, tapping into its capacities? And what are some of the limitations? You heard Alicia talk about, you know, we should have tapped into the existing resources and networks um, to help respond to the crisis at hand. But from your view, you know, what could it have done? I, I really like Alicia's analogy of how the Commonwealth is deserving of a C because it's shown up it's spoken a little bit, but it's not delivered the goods. And the way I think that could be extended is that when you think of a group assignment, typically the hardest part is figuring out who you're going to work with in order to execute that group assignment. I think one of the reasons why the Commonwealth's performance is so disappointing is that it's overcome the most challenging part. It has that group. It has it, that history, that connection between countries. But in spite of that, as Sir Sanders and as Alicia have been saying, it hasn't been able to coordinate action it hasn't been able to implement anything. So as far as the question of what it could have done, I think it could have in many cases done the bare minimum. And what I mean by this is to elaborate on some of what Alicia's already said is that as soon as the pandemic began, for example, it could have convened some kind of forum between heads of states, between national governments and their representatives in order to think about what their response was going to be. I think it's hard to say what the Commonwealth could have been because we're not in the position to know what the range of resources and what the range of capacities of each of its member countries could have been. But those member countries are in that position. And I think that at the very least, what the Commonwealth ought to have done is gather everyone together and ask openly in a democratic and participatory way, how are we going to respond to the pandemic? How are we as a political association going to respond to the many challenges that lie in our path in a way that distinguishes us from other multilateral organizations and that in fact can set the tone for those multilateral organizations. Because what distinguishes us from the rest of them is that we have that history, is that we have those connections. And so we don't have to get over the very difficult parts of trying to know who we are and where we come from and what our histories are. That's already been set up for us.
So I think that that is at the very least that could have been expected from an organization like the Commonwealth. We really didn't see much of that. And I think that if I were to give a a, 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 a rating to the Commonwealth, I would, I would actually give it an F just because I think that there's more that we can expect from it just because its history is so unique and unlike any other history of a multilateral organization, one that gives it far more potential than the others. Oh, William, certainly not as diplomatic in his rating, but Sir Ronald, let me bring you in. Uh, you know, you heard Sir Gluckman talk about the need to push multilateralism uh, more formally from the Commonwealth. And, and he talked about the need for more technical support systems. In a practical sense, what should that look like? Well, you know, the Eminent Persons Group report, which is what you're discussing here uh, at its 10th anniversary, laid out all of those plans. So it's not as if anybody had to go invent what to do. It was in the report. The report addresses it. And um, uh, I think that the, the reality is that the, the Commonwealth does have the machinery for doing it. Uh, the problem is it has not implemented that machinery. But look, the, the Commonwealth always has an excuse. Unlike other organizations, the Commonwealth is a voluntary organization of sovereign states. They freely associate with each other. They're not a treaty organization. They're not bound by any legal rules. Uh, they can say all sorts of things and don't do it without, without having to pay a penalty. Um, and, and they do, frankly. Uh, and, and that's because the, of, the, of the kind of mis mismatch of what the, 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 Caribbean, uh, the Commonwealth is. It's a, a series of 32 small states from the Pacific, from the Caribbean and Africa. Uh, it's a rich uh, OECD country like the United Kingdom and Canada. Uh, and then there are the emerging powers like India, Nigeria. Uh, each of them bring, it, it's a kind of um, variable geometry, if you like. They, they, come to, they come to this problem from different angles. Uh, that does not mean they could not build a consensus. They could build a consensus. But we, for instance, had pointed out in our report, and at the time when we were writing that report, it was HIV AIDS that was raging around the world. And we made the point then that pandemics would continue, that the HIV AIDS would not be the end to it. And incidentally, COVID-19 is not going to be the end of pandemics either. We've got future pandemics to come. We warned then that the world was not prepared for pandemics that there was no system of proper coordination, notwithstanding what the World Health Organization was trying to do. Because remember, the World Health Organization executive board is made up of, of countries, the most influential of which are the richest. And they're the ones who want to pay the least for uh, international coordination. It suits them to have countries come to them to beg because then they, they exercise political influence. Two things I want, two points I want to make about what's happening now with COVID-19. First of all, many countries are deprived of vaccines. The reason they're deprived of vaccines is twofold. One, the major manufacturers of the vaccines are in the developed world, in Europe and in North America. They are not releasing those vaccines to be produced, franchising them to other parts of the world because they're making the money and the money is running into billions of dollars every year now. Uh, the governments are not insisting that they should release the copyright because the governments want that the revenues to continue to flow to their own country. It's protectionist trade in a sense. But we said at, uh, in the Eminent Persons Group report that vaccines are a global good. There cannot be a commodity traded like rice or potatoes. Uh, th this is people's lives and livelihoods we're talking about. And we suggested that the Commonwealth uh, sh Secretariat should set up relations with pharmaceutical companies, with private sector organizations like Bill Gates, uh, to try to develop a, 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 a system by which this would have been addressed. Now, we said that 10 years ago. We're now with COVID. Had that been done, we would have had a mechanism for dealing with it. Now, we also said that one of the things that troubled us is that 
in relation to global funds that were set up, and I have to say they were minuscule at the time, just as they're minuscule now, for fighting the HIV uh, pandemic 10 years ago, some countries were exempted. A country like mine, Antigua and Barbuda, a population of 100,000 people. Do you know why we were exempted from getting concessionary financing to fight a global disease? Because we are supposedly a high per capita income country. Just incidentally, so too is the Bahamas. Uh, and this idea that we are high income countries fails to take account of our vulnerability as small states popped out in the, in the ocean uh, with uh, very remote, having to import everything that we eat and buy and build with and, and the rest of it and the high costs that we are importing from outside. Now, uh, it's a stupid, uh, and I've used the word advisedly, stupid criteria, one which we have been fighting for years. And in the imminent persons group report, we said that one of the things the Commonwealth through the Commonwealth Secretariat should have been doing was talking with the IMF or the World Bank to establish a vulnerability criteria that put aside this nonsense of per capita income because poor countries uh, can't be judged by that standard. Um, in any event, none of that happened. So we're still in a situation where countries like mine and the Bahamas can't get access to concessional, concessional financing to buy COVID vaccines the so-called COVAX facility that was set up to facilitate small countries, we had to pay. We didn't get it for free. And now what are we doing? We are begging the United States to give us some of their vaccines from their overstock surplus because we do not have enough for people and we can't buy it from the main manufacturers because they have nothing to sell us. They've already sold it off to 10 major countries in the world. So that's the catch-22 that we're in. The Commonwealth could have done something to address it, and that plan was laid out in the Eminent Persons Group report. Ignore. Right. Certainly a missed opportunity for the Commonwealth, um, hence this vaccine apartheid, if you will, that we're experiencing. But let's shift gears a bit in the conversation and, and move to looking ahead. You know, we've seen and we agree that the Commonwealth could have done more when it came to uh, responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. Climate change is upon us. The kind of crisis is something that's very real for many countries across the world. So when we look at that particular topic, you know, um, many of us would like to see the Commonwealth be more of a presence on the international stage when it comes to the climate crisis, and not least to defend the needs and interests of its small and vulnerable states, as you just said, Sir Ronald, that are on the front line of this emergency. But William, let me come to you, you know, in, in terms of what could be done in your view to reinvigorate or reform the Commonwealth so it could be a much more influential player around these issues like climate change? I think Sir, Sir Sanders pointed out a very important difference between how the Commonwealth is associated and how other multilateral organizations are. And in the Commonwealth being a voluntary organization, I honestly think that's probably the biggest obstacle towards it acting in an effective, coordinated and sustainable way. Because what that allows for is it allows its member states to be governed first and foremost by their short term self-interests, because there's nothing compelling them to think about the long term. As much as these crises are grave, they're severe, they're knocking on our doors quite ferociously, I still think that it's it's the modus operandi of a of a nation state that you you think primarily about what is in your interests and these states aren't to blame for acting in that way i think that the only way in which you can reform and restructure the commonwealth such that it can be a bigger presence on important issues like climate change is if you reconstitute it such that it binds the states that are part of it to obligations to each other and obligations to each other absent the fulfillment of which there would be some penalties. So I think that that is the only way in which you can see some serious action from the Commonwealth and the Commonwealth in its participation and relationship to, to other countries and other organizations. And I think it's all the more pertinent on issues like climate change, because when states, for example, commit to net zero targets or to phasing out fossil fuel sectors, the only way that can happen is, is if there is some cost in, in, in failure to do so.
So I think that the Commonwealth can think of mechanisms to implement internally so that states can collectively hold each other accountable to the targets for for avoiding and mitigating climate change that they set for themselves. And I think that especially in climate change, if it were to pursue that line of, of, of operation, then it could set the standard of, of how climate change is dealt with globally. Because like COP illustrates and like other processes have illustrated, the problem is that you can't get states to do anything, to commit to anything seriously. So I think that the Commonwealth can be a path breaker in that way, but that's going to require a fundamental restructuring. You know, Alicia, let me get your take on this because you sat in the meetings at COP26. You know, how do we make that fundamental restructuring that William was talking about to see states hold each other accountable within the Commonwealth family, you know, that Sir Ronald said is so diverse. You have the big and powerful, you have the smaller nations which are geographically uh, disadvantaged, all under this same body. Um, how can we actually see that happen? Where does this leave the Commonwealth as a multilateral player uh, in terms of making some real change when it comes to the climate crisis? One of the important shifts that we need to make within the Commonwealth and within many institutions, in fact, is away from focus on state to mean leaders and representatives to a focus on people. We need more people-driven action. One of the things that I've noticed as an advocate is that governments, uh, government officials can go off to international spaces and make these promises and the people at home never hear about it. They have no idea what has been promised. Now, some of us are paying attention and we know those things and we try to hold governments accountable, but a lot of those commitments that they make in these international spaces are unpopular at home. And because they are so focused on their own political longevity over progress for the country, they are going to take the actions that get them that re-election, in, in the case of the Bahamas, in the next five years. And to, to have political will, we have to build it for ourselves on the ground. So there needs to be a focus on the people on the ground who can actually have these conversations, sort of translate it so that people understand this material in, in terms of in, in climate change. It can be quite difficult to understand when we're talking about science, we're talking about 1.5 to stay alive. What does that mean? The temperature was 88 degrees today. I don't understand this 1.5. Who is going to break that down for people? How will people understand how our everyday actions are impacting the environment? And not only that, how the environment is impacting our lives and our livelihoods. Because for a lot of t people, we are separate from the earth. We're not connected. So there's no concern about trees or, or whatever, you know, carbon emissions, what does that mean? I'm trying to get to work every day. So how can we talk to people in a way that's very accessible so that they understand what's happening and so that they join us in lobbying the government to stay true to the commitments that they make in international spaces? And another thing that the Commonwealth definitely needs to do to get more participation and for people to buy in is to recognize its past. It has to acknowledge the past of colonization, of slavery, and even neo-colonization, because there are so many people who refuse to participate in Commonwealth spaces because that has not yet been done, because we still do not have reparations. There's a 10-point reparations plan that CARICOM has put together, and the first point on that plan is to acknowledge that something wrong <laughs> has been done, acknowledge the wrong. And that goes a very long way in getting people to participate and to believe that this body, this community is real, and it goes a long way in actually ensuring that the wealth is common. Because right now, commonwealth is just a word. But until we actually start redistribution of wealth, that doesn't really mean anything. Yeah, Sir Sanders, I want to bring in something that you said in a different conversation, that multilateralism gives smaller nations a voice and a vote. Right, and We're not seeing that enough, especially now when bigger states should be held accountable. I had a conversation with the Madagascan Environment and Ministry, or rather Minister, um, earlier this week, and she said, we're not asking for aid. These funds that were pledged by the bigger nations is not aid. These are accountability funds. And so if we're keeping that in mind, how do we essentially ensure that they pay up? Well, how do we how do, we do it now? Um... Uh, we, we are forced to join almost every international body there is. Uh, 
even though we don't have the amount, the same revenues that countries like the United States or Japan or Germany or France have, we have to join the same organization. Why do we do it? We do it because if we know that if we don't have a seat at the table, it's because we're part of the menu. In other words, we're being eaten if we are not there to make sure that we don't we avoid ending up uh, uh, on the plate. So we join all of these organizations and we try very hard uh, to make our voices felt. The problem is there is no unity in the countries of the South. Developing countries have absolutely no unity, none. And I'll give you typical examples in my own lifetime that I've experienced. When the African, Caribbean and Pacific group negotiated with the European Union, uh, the Lome conventions and before that the Cotonou agreements, which were the aid trade and uh, investment agreements between Europe and, and uh, the Caribbean, Africa and the Pacific, we did it together. Africa, Caribbean and the Pacific united in fighting Europe. Uh, on the establishment of the Cotonou Agreement and the first Lomé Convention. And then the Europeans decided this unity is not good because it's too strong, so we should break it up. So what did they do? Instead of having uh, one group, we then became three groups. And Africa was one side, Caribbean was another, and then the Pacific. And then they broke Africa into separate groups. The French, for instance, told the, Africa, the French Africans you should join your own group because after all, you're still using our French currency. You're more closely linked to us than you are to the other French African countries. They bought into that argument. We split ourselves apart. The Europeans then took us one at a time in small groups and negotiated unequal treaties with us called the Economic Partnership Agreement. And that unequal relationship exists in the Caribbean, exists in the Pacific, and exists in Africa. Now, uh, Here's one of the typical examples of how unequal, unequal a relationship that is. At the time we negotiated that agreement, 28 European Union countries, which included the United Kingdom uh, at the time, the Brexit, Brexit had not yet occurred, uh, was very much a part of that. Now, this, they were a unity. They were one. But they did not sign an agreement with a union of Caribbean countries or a union of Pacific countries, or a union of African countries. These 28 powerful nations signed agreements with each of the other countries individually. So you take a country like St. Kitts Nevis, which has a population of 50,000 people. St. Kitts Nevis has an agreement with the European Union, 28 large countries, millions of people, far more money. Now, who do you think would win if, if they had to go to a trade dispute? on that matter. Like, you know, the, the point is obvious. What I'm making is we allow ourselves, we, the South allows itself to be picked off. And um, once that situation happens, uh, then unfortunately, the South will never be able to stand up for itself. And what we see are the disparities and inequities that exist in all UN organizations and in the Commonwealth and in the Organization of American States, where incidentally, I am also the ambassador, and I will be chairing a meeting of the General Assembly of the Organization of American States next week. Uh, these disparities and equities it, it exist as well. And it's all because the countries of the South uh, have no, you know, we talk about things like the non-aligned movement. That has now drifted into practical oblivion. I really do. I wish if I had the answer to that question, I would be one of the most successful diplomats in the world and everybody would be writing books about me. Uh, but the truth of the matter is I have tried myself to, to make that point that without unity, there is no strength and that small countries, developing countries will never get the look. We've been exploited all all throughout our existence colonialism, the aftermath of colonialism, we are still suffering it today. You know, we in the Caribbean talk about reparations for slavery and we're not joking about it because reparations for slavery, for, incidentally for us, is not just about cash. It's about all of the damage you have done in creating the kind of economies that we have and upon which we are now dependent on you. That was the legacy with which we were left. 
And that is a legacy which we continue to perpetuate today uh, by just following it. You know, there are no trade links between Africa and the Caribbean. If I wanted to buy something from Kenya, Kenya would have to send it to London and then London would have to send it to, to Miami and then Miami would ship it to me. That's how long it would take for, for it to get there. If I wanted to go to Kenya on holiday, I couldn't jump on a plane uh, in Antigua as I can to fly to London or to New York or to Paris, to Kenya. I have to go to one of these metropoles, even though as the crow flies, the Gambia is the closest country to, to the Caribbean uh, because it's just across the ocean and right there. And yet there are no connections. Whose fault is that, if not our own? Because we have the capacity to do something about it. But it seems that we prefer to continue the colonial structures that have been imposed upon us. I, I want to hear from you, Alicia, just to, you know, to come off of what Sir Ronald has said. This legacy that we've been left with, one of division uh, that has kept the, the global south at odds with each other. Um, you know, as we're looking forward at the renewal for the Commonwealth and what it, it could be, I want to refer to what Sir Peter mentioned earlier when you're speaking to me about the future of the Commonwealth and, and where the opportunities might lie. Um, we've seen the erosion of solidarity. Sir Ronald has painted that picture very clearly for us. And it's being a, even a greater existential threat than pandemics or climate change. And we can attest to that through this conversation. But how do we reinvigorate global solidarity and just feelings of global kinship? And I think that's probably the biggest uh, word right there, to bring up that camaraderie and, and brotherhood or sisterhood, if you will. What role could the Commonwealth play in that? How could that be achieved in your view, Alicia? There are some relatively small, simple things that we can do to start to foster that global solidarity again, or in, in some cases for the first time. One of them, again, is is peer learning and finding our, our commonalities. So it's very easy to sit down and talk about our problems, right? Anytime you have a conversation about solutions, you'll find people sort of go in the problem direction, and then you have to pull them back. So, And there's an opportunity there to talk about these issues and identify the ones that we share. So as an example, when we talk about climate change, the Caribbean and the Pacific are in very similar positions. We have different kinds of economies. We have different ge geographic positions, but our experiences are very similar with very different kinds of climate events, climate disasters. How can we learn from each other? How can we build solidarity just between the two regions? How can we form coalitions and caucuses to go come to the Commonwealth uh, to get the other regions on board, to, to go to other institutions to call for change and to demand change and reform in some of these systems and to get what we need from other countries, the countries that hold the wealth that we don't have, as we, we've already discussed. And again, we have to start with the people. We have to start with where people are and understanding that that is where you build power with individuals. It's not in institutions. Institutions are just ideas. They're just theoretical. And in many cases, as I believe is the case with the Commonwealth, they tend to be quite aspirational. But you need people to move it to action, to get things done. And one of the most difficult things that I've found in my work, and that I think we find across the Commonwealth as well, is that the people that you need to get on board don't have time. They do not have time to care. They're busy working. They're busy trying to stay alive. They're busy taking care of people for no pay, right? So the issues that we really need to address to be able to move these bigger issues, we need to deal with the micro as well. We need to address the issue of poverty. And I'm talking about financial poverty as well as time poverty, which is very real, especially for people who are in situations of vulnerability, including women, LGBTQI plus people, migrant people, people with disabilities, and, and people who are more traditionally experiencing poverty on a cyclical long-term level. Until we are able to address their basic needs, as is noted in the Commonwealth Charter, with prioritizing food, health, and shelter, we won't be able to mobilize them and get them to care about these global issues, national issues, and regional issues even. To be able to get people to move, they have to be able to eat. They have to know that their children can get their education. They have to be able to 
listen to the news, to understand analysis, to be able to participate in that analysis, and then come to that conversation about what our problems are, what we share, who has what resources, who can contribute what, and then not just making a plan that sits on a shelf, but figuring out how we implement that plan and how we take real action. And I want to kind of forward that thought as we wrap up the conversation. We have a few minutes to go. Um, just to get your thoughts on a significant or meaningful change or reform in the Commonwealth um, that you'd like to see. William, I'll start with you. What should it be? Well, I think a meaningful change in the Commonwealth is that it needs to start to become a binding institution. I think it needs to be an institution that holds its members to a set of principles, to a set of tasks, and to a set of commitments. And there would be consequences for failure to adhere to those, and the members would feel entitled to hold each other accountable. I think something that Alicia is saying now and has been saying throughout is, is crucially important, which is that what the Commonwealth has to be is people-led. It can't be state-led. And there's a way in which I think that when thinking about how do we revive the spirit of solidarity globally, and we think back nostalgically to previous examples throughout history, whether it's the Bandung Conference, the Non-Aligned Movement, the Organization of African States, the attempt at the new international economic order, one of the reasons those efforts failed is because they were led by people in boardrooms, not by people on the streets. And I think the important way that the Commonwealth can, can make a change and set itself up as a vehicle for the concerns of everyday people, for the actions of everyday people, is if it becomes an organization that people can put pressure on their governments to participate in and, and to realize the obligations that are placed on them. Because so long as it's this institution that you can voluntarily participate in, if you don't do something, nothing really happens, then there's going to be no interest on the part of the ordinary citizen to take it seriously. Because the ordinary citizen is going to say to you, if I mobilized people on the streets to put pressure on my government to, to use this vehicle and nothing becomes of it, why should I care? Why should I invest that energy? Why should I invest the time, as Alicia is saying? People have pressing and demanding jobs to work. People have their basic needs to meet. So in order to reconstitute the Commonwealth such that it can be an organization that ordinary people feel like is a tool to amplify their voices, it has to be an organization where there are consequences if governments and don't do anything about any of the commitments that they undertake collectively. You know, I have to ask this of Alicia before I come to Sir Ronald, uh, just in terms of what you said um, on governments delivering on basic needs in the charter. Do you think the Commonwealth institutions should play a greater role in asking governments to deliver on that particular charter? How can that be done effectively? Yes, absolutely. The Commonwealth needs to take a leading role in pushing governments to meet the basic needs of people. And we've seen in the global south, in particular in the Caribbean, the effect of structural adjustment programs, where there is just so much debt that governments have withdrawn their support and there is literally no safety net. There's no social safety net. So people are on their own to figure out their health needs, education, all of these different things are, are on the backs of people. And it means that poverty remains cyclical. It's not really possible to get out of it on your own. You know, there's no, there are no bootstraps to pull yourself up by. So I think that if we are to move forward, two key words for the Commonwealth are wealth redistribution. That's what needs to happen. If we really do prioritize human rights, if we really do believe that gender equality is necessary, if we really want to see that people's basic needs are met, it has to start with redistributing wealth. And in the Caribbean in particular, we have to look at reparations. So, Ronald, what are some of the reforms you'd like to see the Commonwealth Institute moving forward? I was the rapporteur of the eminent person group in which wrote exactly what reforms we wanted to see. And uh, I, I would commend that people read it uh, because the blueprint exists. Uh, and 
you know, everybody could come to this uh, trying to reinvent the wheel, but we spent three years of our lives uh, writing that report and taking evidence from over 360 uh, organizations throughout the Commonwealth uh, in, in writing that report in terms of how the Commonwealth could be more relevant, how it could be more focused. Now, look, the Commonwealth is not a binding treaty organization. It's a group of countries that have got together and decided they would stay together voluntarily. Uh, there is no <clears throat> compulsion for them to do anything. What they do, they do on a basis of agreement. Now, you can't get agreement on everything from countries that are so diverse with such great varying interests. Uh, you know, if you look back on what the Commonwealth's great successes have been, they've really been only in two areas, and both of them have been political. One was the ending of the Unilateral Declaration of Independence by Ian Smith in southern Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, and the other was the fight against apartheid and the freeing of Nelson Mandela. Uh, those were the two great successes. Now, you ask yourself, why did those successes occur? Well, the truth of the matter is the majority of the Commonwealth governments were behind those two efforts. All of Africa was united on it. Asia was united behind Africa. The Caribbean was with Africa and uh, Asia on that matter. So who did you have left out? Uh, only the so-called white Commonwealth, which is Britain, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. Eventually, Canada came on board and, uh, and, then, uh, so, and so did Australia in two very significant leaders, Bob Hawke of Australia and, um, and uh, the leader of Canada at the time whose names got out of my head, even though I can see his face. Um, but in any event, once the white Commonwealth began to shift, only one Commonwealth country was isolated, and that was Britain. And Margaret Thatcher eventually had to concede on the face of the fact that every other Commonwealth country felt that sanctions needed to be applied against the apartheid regime in South Africa to bring it to its, to its heels. But the Commonwealth alone could not have done that. The reason and the primary reason why uh, South Africa eventually, in the terms of the apartheid regime, came to the table is that they had failed in Angola and Mozambique because of Cuban troops. The United States became concerned about that. There was an international effort after that. So the Commonwealth was a catalyst only because governments, except the United Kingdom, had canvassed, had coalesced be, behind those two issues and therefore managed to persuade international opinion as well. Now, I was a young high commissioner in London at the time. Uh, we're talking 1984, 1985, 86. Um, uh, but th those struggles were real struggles and, they, and there was real unity. Now, the Commonwealth has not had issues of that kind. When you come to matters of economics and trade, the Commonwealth is not a very useful organization uh, because Commonwealth countries, Caribbean, for instance, trades with, uh, with the United Kingdom for the reasons I've told you but 60% of all trade is with the United States of America. And trade follows neighbor, your neighbors and supply. Uh, we, we, can't, we can't trade with Africa and, and uh, Pacific because they're too far away. And it's the same uh, happens in, in, a, in vice versa. Now, we can take positions on trade issues globally if we can find a common set of things and circumstances we want to pursue. And uh, it finding those common set of circumstances will always be a difficulty for countries whose interests are so diverse. And if you have rich countries and poor countries, the interests are naturally different. Uh, so what are, one of the things we had suggested in the Commonwealth Eminent Persons re Report is that recognizing there are two, two commonwealths. Eh? First of all, there's the official commonwealth, the commonwealth of governments, and then there's the Commonwealth of Civil Society. And the Commonwealth does have 90, 90 civil society organizations that are functioning daily and cooperating with each other in a, in a range of fields. The problem with them is that they don't see a leadership uh, from the state in terms of the, 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 the cooperation that they themselves exercise. So we had decided the thing to do was to find priorities on which all countries in the Commonwealth could agree. And let us make sure that those are the priorities that the Commonwealth pursues.
because the Commonwealth is not the United Nations. The Commonwealth is not a regional group uh, that's promoting a regional interest. It's made up of 54 countries drawn from all over the world. And that's the cliche we like to use. We represent all these races and all these religions, and every geographic uh, part of the world. And that is true, but we do not make sufficient use of it. And what the Commonwealth needs now more than anything else is leadership. And it hasn't had leadership for over two decades. Uh, it needs an evangelical set of people who will say we actually do see some value in the Commonwealth, in these nations that are spread across the world, because they have some common commonality between them. They speak the same language, they have the same common law, they read the same books, uh, mostly they all play cricket, and um, except the Bahamas, and, uh, and therefore we can, we can do all of these things together. And we can take that, that commonality that we share and try to use it as an influence for good in the world. But all of that is easily said. It's not easily done. It needs committed leadership. And that is what it is lacking. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Ronald. And let me finish with you, William, on something you had said going back to uh, just tapping into, for lack of a better term, people power. Right. And, and really leveraging on the citizenry within the Commonwealth. Sir Ronald talked about the two Commonwealths of the government and civil society. But what do you expect to see, for instance, coming out of the Commonwealth People's uh, Conference and, and forum rather? And what kind of issues would you want to see people raise to make sure their voices are heard? I think the the issues that I'd like to see people raise are the ones that were canvassed by Alicia. I think wealth redistribution is a is a big one. Thinking about these inequities that Saran was also highlighting earlier, there's a massive rift between the OEC, OECD member states of Britain, uh, New Zealand, Canada, Australia, uh, the emerging markets, and the developing world. And I think that redistributing wealth so that countries are, are, are economically leveled and so that they are politically leveled is a key issue. I think issues which try to end the exploitation of some countries against others, I think uh, 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 an increasingly important issue on the global political agenda is the issue of tax justice. Multinational corporations that are housed in, in some countries are yearly siphoning the, the billions and trillions of dollars that they generate in, in Africa and the Caribbean and in Asia into offshore tax havens and depriving those countries of the tax earnings and revenues that they deserve and the revenues that they need to use to invest in their people, to build houses, to build railways, to build buses, to build schools, to build hospitals. So I think that the issues have to do with economic inequality, have to do with wealth redistribution, have to do with ending exploitation, ending neocolonialism and ending all of these problems which undermine the ability of countries when they are in an association like the Commonwealth from engaging each other on a level playing field. I think these are the issues that I think that I would like to see come out. The climate crisis, of course, goes without saying. And I think that the climate crisis is an especially thorny one for countries in the developing world because a lot of countries feel like they are being compelled to prioritize the transition into renewable energy and so on when they lack the resources to do so. So I think talking about technology transfers, infrastructure transfers to help less wealthy countries make the required transition away from polluting fossil fuels are also other issues that I'd like to be uh, like to see on the agenda. And I think those are going to be the issues that are put in the agenda. There is a thriving civil society in the Commonwealth, as Sir Ron was talking about. There are people who are leading with the solutions, as Alicia is talking about. So I think the problem, as everyone has been discussing today, is not so much what the people are saying, is not so much the solutions that they are putting on the table. It's a lack of leadership from the states themselves. It's a lack of leadership from those political decision makers. And, and that's what we need to see more of.
Couldn't have said it better myself, but thank you so much to our wonderful speakers today, Sir Peter Gluckman from New Zealand, Sir Ronald Sanders from Antigua and Barbuda, Alicia Wallace from the Bahamas, and William Shoki from South Africa. Thank you for sharing your thoughts so generously and for, for provoking us to think and perhaps inspire us to act, which is what this is all about. And perhaps just some of my thoughts and reflections of what was said uh, in this conversation, you know, the responsibility to transform the Commonwealth into a real force for good, as Sir Gluckman had said earlier, doesn't just lie with governments, but the people, you, me, all 2.4 billion of us who are tasked with holding those governments to account. Well, the Commonwealth is at a crossroads right now and has a choice to be a museum piece or to reinvigorate itself to become a living, breathing body of nations that innovate new forms of governance, engage citizens more effectively, improve social cohesion, and take up the moral responsibility for championing human rights. And this is the starting point of our third and final conversation to air in exactly one week's time in our final episode Again, with different speakers, we will be taking a close look at the structures and processes of the Commonwealth and how it engages the member states, the Commonwealth citizens, and the wider international community. Please join us for what will no doubt be another challenging and exciting event. On behalf of myself and our esteemed panel, the Commonwealth Foundation, thank you for joining us for this critical conversation. We'll see you next time. Bye for now.